glad that you're here. Hey, if you can, I want to invite you to stand your feet with us. We're going to enter into a time of worship together. Listen, we believe that God is worthy of the praise that he is due. Listen to, listen to this. Everywhere we go, no matter where we are, inside this building, outside of this building, we live a life of worship. Worship is offering up our bodies as a living sacrifice before the God who created us and saying, with the choices that I make, I will be obedient to you, Lord, and I will follow you. Right now, we're going to sing about that praise. We're going to sing about and declare that we can and will praise him wherever we go because he is there with us at our job, at school. Right now, he's here with us in this place. So let's sing. Sometimes he's got to dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise him when it don't make sense. Sometimes he's got to step down the giant and worship from the light. Sometimes you've got to shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's going to get you there. Sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air, say, I'll praise you anywhere, sing praise, give him praise, give him praise in the high.
That's when my frustration gets so out of hand But it's then I am reminded That I've never been forsaken I've never had to stand one test alone That's when I look at all the victories And the Spirit rises up in me And it's through the fire my way about the through series I was meeting with Austin and worship team and we were talking about songs that have the idea of going through things and there's so many in fact when I started thinking about all the worship songs that we did many of our worship songs carried that concept and you just sang a great old song a little while ago amazing grace did you catch it through many dangers toils and snares um, so Austin and I were going over songs that had through through the fire, we just did a moment ago. That's the title of today's message. But uh, last, last power lift, that's a men's lunch. Um, Austin did a song that brought back a lot of memories. It's hard to believe it. I started preaching when I was 16. In fact, I preached my first revival summer after my junior year. And there was a brand new song out. And I remember singing it in that revival right before I preached in one of the services and I've loved it through the years and Austin sang it last month and I think really it's probably the ultimate through song it goes something like this I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow there have been times I didn't know right from wrong but in every situation, God gave his consolation that my trials had come to only make me strong. I've been a lot of places and I've seen so many faces and yet there were times I felt so all alone. 
But in those lonely hours, yes, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know I was still his own. That's how I sing through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned I can depend upon His Word. Austin. I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valley. And I thank him for the storms he brought me through. Here's my favorite lyric. For if I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them, yes. I'd never know what faith in his word can do. So I got a song to sing today. I sing through it all. I sing through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. Yes, I've learned to trust in God. And through it all, oh, oh, oh through it all, oh, that I've learned to depend upon His Word. Oh, yes, so now I see. At some point in our lives, we all experience a situation we wish we didn't have to. We think, if only I could find some way to go around it, or maybe go back and avoid it. But by that point, there's only one way to go, and that's through. Tougher question today. What have you had to go through because you did the right thing? Hey, I've gone through a lot of stuff because I did the wrong thing. Wasn't surprised by that. But what have you had to go through because you said the right thing, did the right thing, made the right choice? It's always kind of a surprise, isn't it, when we go through difficult things because we do the right thing. You know, when you're a kid, your parents tell you if you're a good little boy or if you're a good little girl, then good things are going to happen to you. I remember my mother telling me that. And yet, the older you get, just to be perfectly honest, life doesn't seem to work that way. I stress seem, but life doesn't seem to work that way. I love the Psalms. Mary Alice and I read the Psalms every morning. One of the things I love about the Psalms is that God allows the psalmist, and specifically David, to be very honest about having bad days. And I'm thankful for that because traditional religions kind of communicate that you're supposed to go around with a smiley face on all the time and pretend that everything's wonderful. Well, thankfully, God allowed David to have a lot of honesty and put it in the Bible. Now, I want you to hear what David says. He says, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping. I was almost gone. He's not talking about standing in a slippery place, literally, he's talking about the fact that he's just about to the place where he's questioning whether to continue as a God follower. 
Now, I'm glad, I mean, first of all, this is David and Goliath fame. This is King David fame. This is the guy that God said was a man after his own heart. And yet, you and I just heard him say on a bad day that things were so crazy, he was thinking about giving up. Well, what caused him to feel that way? Verse 3, he said, I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. They don't have troubles like other people. They clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Anybody else ever feel that way? Like, I don't understand why bad people have it good and good people have it bad. I don't, I don't understand. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to do the honest thing. I'm trying to do the moral thing. I'm trying to do the kind thing. And instead of getting approval, I get censored. Well, if you feel that way, it's okay to say it. I mean, God let David put it in the Bible. And it is true. I mean, we studied this in the Revelation series. The issue with our world is this world is upside down. Life's not fair. It's not equitable. And we don't understand why. I did the right thing. Why do I have to suffer? You know, when I picked the title for this series, I wanted it to be just one word through because we use other words to describe different situations. We talk about going through valleys when we're going through a sad time. We talk about going through the gauntlet when we're dealing with a whole lot of problems at one time. And then when we talk about going through deep water, what, what we mean is we're just sort of overwhelmed. It's like life has submerged us. But we have an expression, don't we, for going through injustice? Some of you know what it's like to go through a protracted season of injustice when life is not fair. And when you're describing it to somebody else, what do we say? We say, I've been through the fire. If you tell me you've been through the fire, I know what you're telling me at some point, you've been through something that wasn't fair. You've been through something that was painful and difficult, even though you did the right thing. I mean, if I do the wrong thing, I don't talk about going through the fire. I talk about, well, I reap, I reap what I sow. It's kind of amazing, though, just to think about that expression, through the fire, because fire is not something you go through typically. Fire is something you go into and don't come out of. Fire tends to finish. And after all these years of pastoring, you know what I've discovered? I, I've discovered that a lot of people don't go through the fire because injustice changes them. Injustice changes their whole personality. They go into it a sweet, kind, loving person but they, after dealing with injustice, they're not the same person anymore. I've known people go through, in, go through injustice and come out in insecurity. I've seen people go through injustice and come out bitter. And God forbid, I've even seen, I not only lead New Spring, but I also work with a lot of Christian leaders around the country. I've actually known pastors who went through a, a season of injustice in their church and they came out like looking for vengeance for the rest of the world. Maybe you've known somebody like that. Maybe, maybe this person had a very toxic relationship, toxic marriage with somebody who was really, really a bad person and they've come out of that and God has brought a very sweet woman into his life or God has brought a very good man, a kind man into her life but this person is still transferring the feelings that they had with this other person into a new relationship. So yeah, a, a lot of people don't go through the fire. They experience injustice, but it changes who they are. And like I said from the very beginning today, this is gonna be a more intense message than the others because I think when we start talking about doing the right thing in the face of injustice, I think we have to talk about the very upside down nature of our world today. I want to talk to Christ followers for just a minute. I know that many of us come from various hues on the faith spectrum. But you and I live in a world, when I think about where the world's headed, where America's headed, I see the fires of persecution being kindled for those who are true followers of God. Now, when I say persecution, I don't mean anything like our brothers and sisters in India are going through right now or in Nigeria because you've got family members, you've got brothers and sisters in Christ who gave their lives this week for Jesus Christ. We're not in that world yet. We're kind of dipping our toes in the water. We're, we're dealing with being demonetized. We're dealing with being people saying bad things about us on social media. 
Or some of you deal with a scenario where if you did the right thing, it might, it might threaten your livelihood. Well, I want to say this. What's behind all injustice in our world is that our world is upside down. And when, in a world that's upside down, good is considered evil and evil is considered good. So consequently, if you advocate for good, you're regarded as a bad person. And if you advocate for evil, you're regarded as a good person. That is the nature of the world when it is upside down. And in our world today, for one who speaks the truth, you can sometimes even be classified as a hater. Let's just talk about the elephant in the phone booth because there's always an issue du jour. There's always an issue of the day. And right now, the issue of the day is what's considered gender identity. And we're watching a very fast shift in our culture today. According to Reuters, in 2017, there were 15,000 children ages 13 through 17 seeking treatment. But by 2021, that number had ballooned to over 42,000, tripled in just four years. Do you take statistics in college? You understand the statistics have a basis. And looking at that tripling in a matter of four years, there's only one reality that can come out of that, and that is there's an agenda in our culture and there's a lot of grooming going on. A recent study covered in multiple news outlets says that gender reassigning surgeries increased threefold in the years from 2016 to 2019. But the article I read said that there were only 8% minors. I guess we're supposed to take encouragement from that. But the number was still 8,000. And that data is four years old. How do you feel about that? Would you have a problem with a child's body being carved up before they've even had a chance to grow up and figure life out? You have a problem with that? A lot of people don't. I can tell you this. 30 years ago, just about all people would have screamed to the high heavens about it. It wouldn't matter if you're red state, blue state, progressive, conservative, it wouldn't matter what you were. 30 years ago, people would have screamed to the high heavens about it, but our, the, the thing about it is, there's no getting around this. And one more time, it goes back to the Clash of Dynasty series because God called all this in the book of Revelation and throughout the rest of the Bible. We know this world is headed toward the Antichrist and everything, everything that God did in the beginning is now being inverted. In the beginning, God. God created, male and female. And that is the nature of the Antichrist would be the opposite of Christ. See, the thing of it is, our world is entering a darkness that we've never seen before. And there's so many other examples. And I assure you, as soon as our culture fully embraces this one, Satan will have something even more sinister. And it'll get even darker. But that's just a single situation. My, my point today is so much broader. And that is that in our culture today, it gets expensive to say something about these things, doesn't it? And many of us are going to keep quiet. We won't say anything about it at all. I hear from new springers who say, well, if I, my, my corporation is supporting some of this stuff and if I say anything about it, it could threaten my position in the corporation. It does get expensive. And many of us will be quiet. Others of us will virtue signal. By that, I mean we will parrot the popular expressions of the day. Because it's as if saying, if I parrot the popular expressions of the day, then I will be regarded as a good person. Hey, being a good person involves a whole lot more than parroting the silly expressions of our culture. I mean, the thing of it is, this is a cheap attempt at self-worth. Let's call it for what it is. Somebody will say, Mark, you, man, you're pastor of a megachurch. Surely you're not going to say these things. I decided a long time ago, my big issue is who I'm going to face when I stand before God. See, I don't want to escape this little fire and wind up in a big one. 
In the book of Isaiah chapter five, the Bible says, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. Now, what sorrow? The old King James says, woe. That sounds really bad, whatever that means. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, the dark is light and light is dark and the bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. I mean, we're, we're, we're having that kind of cultural gaslighting going on in our culture today, and we feel that. But if you think that's strong, listen to how Jesus put it. He said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Or the message puts it this way. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body, and soul in his hands. Well, what do you have to do when you have to go through the tunnel of injustice? When you have to go through the fire? And again, it could be broad. I mean, we've talked about the single issue, but it, it could be so many things. It could be standing up for honesty at work because in your workplace, cheating has become part of the culture and you know that your customers are being taken advantage of. And it could be blowing a whistle and saying, this isn't right, this isn't fair. Or it could be in relationship. You could, it could be standing up for the truth when you're being gaslighted by a sociopath in a toxic, toxic relationship. So we could just, I mean, whatever we, whatever we know that is right, that we should stand up for. And if you stand up for what is right, you recognize that you could deal with consequences. How do you deal with that? Well, instead of me talking about a lot of different points, I just want to take you to a story in the Bible. Now, before we get into the story, it's in Daniel chapter three. Before we get there, I want to give you a little backstory so you'll understand what's going on. By the way, if you want to study more about this in Clash of Dynasties 2, it was the Daniel Chronicles. You can look at the sermon that I preach on this whole story if you want to. But in Daniel, in the book of Daniel chapter 3, the Babylonians are the first world empire. They are the first empire to rule the entire world. And the Babylonians have captured Judah, God's people. God allowed them to be captured because they went into idolatry. Now, the Babylonians had a very interesting way of dealing with conquered peoples. They wanted to take the best and the brightest young people from every culture, bring them to Babylon, give them the best food, give them the best clothes, give them the best education, and then bring them into the Babylonian government. And their idea was if we get the best and brightest and we inculcate into them the Babylonian system, they will become emissaries and missionaries to their own peoples. Now, among, these group, among this group of young people that were captured, there was a young man by the name of Daniel and three of his friends whose name were Hananiah, Mishael, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You probably know them by other names because those, those names that I just quoted for you, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those are names that talk about Jehovah God. But when they got to Babylon, the Babylonians said, hey, you can't bring those names in here. We're going to give you names that are after our gods. And they were given the name Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they didn't complain about being given other names because you can't control what somebody calls you. But now, before I get to Daniel chapter 3, I want to tell you what happened in Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the head of this empire, he was a very volatile man. He could go off the rails at any time. He had a dream one night, and he didn't know what the dream meant, and he had a sense that it was very important. So he called in all of his intelligentsia, who, the Babylonians claimed that they have magical powers. He brought in all his intelligence and he said, I want you guys to tell me my dream and tell me the meaning of the dream. And they said, sir, you tell us your dream and we'll tell you what it means. He said, no, no, no. He said, you're just, you're just making stuff up. If you really have the power that you say you have, tell us the dream and then explain it. And they say, sir, nobody's ever asked for that. And Nebuchadnezzar said, well, I'm not everybody else. And I think you guys are frauds. And he said, if you don't tell me my dream and tell me what it means, I'm going to kill you all. Oh, man, Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were considered part of this group. So Daniel did what he did. He called the three guys together. They had a prayer meeting that night, and God revealed the meaning of the dream to him. Now hang with me because it's going to make a lot of sense in just a moment. So he goes into Nebuchadnezzar and says, sir, let me explain to you what your dream is. He said, you dreamed about a, a tall image rising up to the sky of a man. And this man's body parts were made out of different metals. 
He said there was the head of gold, there were the arms and the chest of silver, there was the torso of bronze, there were the legs of iron and the toes of iron and clay mixture. And he said, sir, these represent the future of the world. These represent coming world empires. Chest and arms, Medo-Persia. Torso, Alexander the Great in bronze. Legs, Roman, uh, iron legs, Rome. T toes of iron and clay mixture, the last day's empire of the Antichrist. And then there was this stone that rolled down a hill, which, by the way, represented Christ. Stone rolled down, hit that statue, crushed it all. And Daniel said to the Nebuchadnezzar, this is what your dream means. Now chapter 3. What happens in verse 1? The Bible says King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall. You understand what Nebuchadnezzar is saying? He's saying, thank you, God. I, it's nice to hear your opinion on what you think is going to happen. So let me tell you what I think, God. I think the whole statue is gold. I think the whole statue is Babylon. I think the whole statue is me. Do you ever know anybody that the whole world is about them? So he makes this gold statue to... One up God, and then he demands that everybody, well, let's read it. Verse four, then a herald shouted, people of all races, nations, and language, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing fiery furnace. Well, everybody bowed, except for three guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You understand? Let me tell you why they didn't bow. You understand the reason why they're in captivity is because they're, they, they're, they're, their ancestors worship idols. They're kind of like, listen, we're not going to get over here, and we're not going to do the same thing that caused our ancestors to get in trouble. We're not going to bow. We cannot bow to another god. And like I've thought through the years, you know, when they played that music and everybody bowed down, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have looked awful tall on the sea of rear ends. So will you. So will you. <laughs> well, wow, does this sound like 2023? But some of the astrologers informed on the Jews, and they post it on social media. They, I put that in there, sorry. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue. The decree also states anyone who refuses to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Now think about this. Think about the ingratitude. I mean, these guys just saved all these other guys from being killed. So does Nebuchadnezzar say, well, okay, they're from a different culture. It's okay. They don't have to bow. Are you kidding? Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance. I mean, you sort of hear what he's saying. He's like, I understand you boys are kind of slow. And you come from the Midwest. You're from flyover country. And maybe you just don't understand that here in Babylon, you have to go along to get along. And here in Babylon, you do what you're told to do or else. We're going to give you one more chance. Now, I don't know how you and I are going to take this message because we're going to live in a day where we have all kinds of opportunities to do the right thing when it's expensive. I don't know if we'll stand up or if we'll cave. I don't. But just for a few moments, I'd like for you to hear what courage sounds like. I mean, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How are they going to answer this? I mean, they know Nebuchadnezzar. They know how crazy he is. They work for him. They know he means business. They know about the furnace. Is it time for them to say, well, ordinarily we wouldn't bow but maybe this is the time that we should just go ahead and bow and God would understand. Hey, that's the problem. God would understand. I want you to hear what courage sounds like. They answered Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us into the fire, the God we serve can rescue us 
from your roaring furnace or anything else you might cook up. But even if he doesn't, do you hear Esther say, if I perish, I perish? I mean, these are young people that have iron in their backbone. But even if he doesn't, it would make a bit of difference, O oh king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Well, they got thrown into the fire. I mean, the Bible says in Daniel 3, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar, his face purple with anger, cut off Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace fired up seven times harder than usual. I guess he seven times as much fuel. He ordered strong men to tie them up. Remember that. And throw them into the roaring furnace. Because the king was in such a hurry and the furnace was so hot, flames from the furnace killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to it. While the fire raged around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, I guess that's the end of the story, right? Suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and said, didn't we throw three men into the fire? That's right, O king, they said. But look, he said, I see, I see four. And that fourth one is different. He looks like the son of God. He was. He was. Well, it's the simplest sermon I've ever preached in my life. I only have two points. They're really obvious. You've already seen them. So I'll just kind of like tell you what you've seen already. What do you do when you have to walk through the fire? What happens if you do walk through it? Number one, if you have to walk through the fire, Jesus will come and walk it with you. I've told you I would give you this verse all five weeks. Isaiah 43, 2, I will be with you when you walk through the fire of oppression. You will not be burned. You will not be consumed. I'm not trying to be tried or flip when I tell you that Jesus has a way of making a special trip to walk with God's daughters and God's sons when they go through the fire for him. There's something about Jesus in which he will just get up and come join you when you're in that fire. I can testify, as much as I don't like being in fires, I can testify that the sweetest times I've ever had with Jesus was when I was walking through the fire and he came and walked with me. It's almost worth it to go through the fire just to have Jesus come hang out with you for a little while. You think that's an anomaly? Let me, re let me give you a couple of cherry-picked illustrations. There was a guy by the name of Stephen in the book of Acts in the New Testament. He was a young deacon and he preached about Jesus, and he, he made the religious elites really angry. And by the way, probably the most, the hottest, the hottest fire you'll have to go through is with religious elites. And they were so angry at him that they started stoning him. They started throwing rocks at him, and they killed him. But before Stephen died, he said, these were his last words. He said, I see heaven open and I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Now that might not mean a whole lot at first blush, but whenever we see Jesus after the resurrection, we always see him seated beside the Father. But this one time we see Jesus get to his feet. Why is he getting to his feet? Because there is one of his family that is standing up for him. And when Stephen left this life and went into heaven, he walked into a standing ovation by the son of God who stood up to meet him. Another story I like is in the gospel of John chapter nine. There's a guy that had been blind all of his life and everybody knew him. He stood, he sat out there and begged for whatever he could get. And they just knew when they were passing him for decades, there's a blind man out there, but Jesus came by one day and he, he told Jesus he would like to receive his sight. And Jesus, in a very creative way, gave him his sight back. Now, everybody in town who knew he'd been blind, they were like, how did this happen? I mean, how are you being, how are you sighted now? And so he told everybody about Jesus. Now, there were some people that were happy about it, but like I said, the religious elites were not happy about it. And they came out there and they said, how dare you talk about Jesus? Give God the glory. I've had that happen a few times when I was asked to give an invocation. You know, they would say, we want you to pray a non-sectarian prayer. 
that means you can talk about God, but you can't mention Jesus. And I've always told them, hey, if I come, Jesus comes with me. And uh, if you don't like Jesus, you sure won't like me. <laughs> but this guy would just, he kept talking about Jesus. And so they kept asking him. You ever have somebody just ask you the same question over and over and over and you answer them? That's why you just get tired of answering them. And so finally this guy got tired of answering the question. I mean, by the way, you just sang words that this guy said. Did you realize that when you sang Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace? Because... They said to him, this guy, Jesus, couldn't have healed you. He's a sinner. He said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know, I was blind, but now I see. Yeah, that's where that lyric comes from in Amazing Grace. <laughs> so finally, he just got frustrated with them when they kept asking him. He said, would you like to become one of his disciples? Whoo, boy, you talk about it hitting the fan. They kicked him. Well, let's read this. They kicked him out of the synagogue, John 9, 34. Now, listen to this. Please listen to this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he went and found the man. Now, do you get this picture? Here is Jesus walking through town looking for this man. Wow. Man, if Jesus was walking through town trying to find you, wouldn't that be pretty important? You know why? He stood. He didn't fold like a cheap suit. If you go through the fire, he'll come, Jesus will come walk with you. Number two, and I love this, this is my favorite one. When you walk through the fire, time out. You remember how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went in the fire? They went in the fire bound up. What did Nebuchadnezzar see? He saw them loose and walking around. Okay, here we go, here's number two. When you walk through the fire, the only thing that burns is the ropes. I don't want to make this personal, but I've just lived this so much. Not recently, because New Spring is a different kind of church. But if I go back in the early days, people used to tell me, and we, think, and we were on the way to becoming New Spring, they would say, if you do this, this is going to happen. If you do this, these people are going to leave. If you do this, people will stop giving. I have to tell you, the only thing I am afraid of is being afraid. I hate the feeling of being afraid. For years, I would say, I only fear God and Mary Alice. And then, <laughs> Mary Alice is like, Mark, people are going to take you seriously. You can't say that. So I quit. But the only thing I fear is being afraid. I was, I've been that way all my life. If someone threatens me, I'm going to make them make good on it. Because I hate the feeling of being afraid. When you go through the fire for doing the right thing and Jesus goes with you and you come out of the fire, people can't scare you with the fire anymore because the ropes have burned off. Some of you out there are so scared to do the right thing because the bullies, the cultural bullies, have scared you. And that's all it took. One of my favorite stories from history is the story of Rosa Parks. Rosa was riding a bus back in 1955 and in the state where she was, the law was, the rule was that if you were African American, you had to sit in the back of the bus. The front of the bus is for white people. And if an African American was in a seat other than the back of the bus and a white person came in, that man or woman would have to get up and go to the back of the bus. But on that day, Rosa was sitting in the middle of the bus and a white person came and she didn't get up. I love what she says in her autobiography, Quiet Strength. She said, I knew that Jesus would help me deal with whatever consequences I had to deal with. <laughs> Rosa said, through the years, you know, people have assumed that I didn't get up because I was tired. She said, I wasn't any more tired than usual. 
And then she said, some have figured that I was elderly. She said, I was only 42. <laughs> she said, the only, the only tired I was, I was tired of giving in. Who's here today and you're tired of giving in? Hmm. You know the right thing. It could be financial. It could be relational. It could be cultural. It could be things that I haven't even thought of today. That's, that part of the sermon you have to preach to yourself. But you know in your gut and you know in your heart that there's something right that you need to do. Hear the courage of Rosa Parks say, I'm tired. I'm tired, all right. I'm tired of giving in and saying I believe what I don't believe. And you may be thrown into the fire, but Jesus will come walk it with you. And you will begin to feel liberation for the first time in a long time. Let me close with it. There's another kind of tired of giving in that I think some of us need to hear today. Because every week I stand here at New Spring and I talk about the good news of Jesus. How that Jesus has made a way for all of us to go to heaven. And I talk about if you invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior. That you can be forgiven of all your sins and have a relationship with God and live forever. That's the word of God. There's a lot more to it, but that's basically it. And many of you here, or North Camp, North Auditorium, or watching online or watching on television, you've gotten very close to that, but along comes this voice inside of you that says things like, how do you know you can live it? Or how do, how, how, what makes you think that with all that you've done, what makes you think that because you pray and invite Jesus to come into your life, what makes you think that that can make all your sins go away? Or how will your friends deal with it? Or if you're in a relationship, I mean, you go home from church and you tell the person you're in a relationship with, I just invited Jesus Christ to come out. He might leave. And so week after week, you hear this message and, and, you, and you almost accept Christ. You almost make the biggest decision of your life, but it's like, well, you know. aren't you tired of giving in? Aren't you tired of missing the greatest gift in the universe? Is there anybody here that's like, you know what? I'm tired of listening to Satan tell me I can't live it. I can't live it and all I can't, but Jesus can live it through me. I, I, I know that it's very simple to invite Jesus Christ to come in, but God said it's a gift. How else would a gift be received? And yeah, I know that other people might not understand, but who knows? I mean, maybe it's going to be through me that God's going to reach them. So I just want to close and say, if you're tired of giving in today, why not? Why not, like Rose, to say, the Lord's going to take me through this. I'm just going to receive Jesus as my Savior. And today's my day. Today's my day. Satan, you can't buck me out of it another minute. Today's my day. Today's my day. Well, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to put breaks in between each line because I want you to decide whether you want to say this to God because it's the biggest thing you've ever done. These aren't magic words. It's what's in your heart that matters, okay? Would you just bow your head with me, please? Here we go. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I believe you love me very much. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe he arose from the grave. And since Jesus is alive, I want him to be my savior. I worship him as my king. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Today's my day. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you just pray with me, I have a gift I want to give you. If you're here on the New Spring campus, all you have to do is text the word PRAYED to 97000. That's P-R-A-Y-E-D to 97000. And then go out to any info center. You'll recognize it by the blue and white color. There's a New Spring Bible in there. There's, there's a, a book I wrote, My New Walk with God. If you're watching online or on television, you can still get this. All you have to do is text the word PRAYED to 97000. Follow the steps and we'll mail it to you. Thanks for being here. Next week, Through the Valley.